To get better insight into survival and wilderness living, I often follow the various contestants of Alone on History Channel both during their journey and after. I am thankful that I do because I found that I have learned much more about what it takes to win the show and to live in the wild from talking with them than actually watching the show itself. Speaking directly with the cast members has proven valuable. One of the more influential participants whom has confirmed my own personal strategy for survival generally has been David McIntyre from season 2 of Alone. I recently asked him whether or not I should give up on trying to be on the show. His answer was succinct. Just like survival, you never give up. So this brings me to my season 4 casting tape, which will be a mix of my own qualifications as well as a good dose of survival and wilderness living theory mixed. If you've been following me on YouTube, you know full well that I've been obsessed with the show and with wilderness living generally. In fact, it's why I started my YouTube channel to begin with. Unfortunately, in all my attempts, I never graduated far enough through the casting process to make it on the show itself. But as Dave says, in survival, you never give up. So why would I bother to apply again? What's different? And why would they consider me for season 4 when I wasn't good enough for season 3 or even season 2? I hope to answer these questions and more in my official season 4 casting tape. Sit back, grab a snack, get comfortable, and listen in. I'm sure you will learn a few things. In this video, I aim to convey my thoughts and theories about what it takes to not only be on the show, but also what it takes to be successful at wilderness living, and to a lesser but still significant extent, how to do so-called survival in general. I will also help illustrate my thoughts by overlaying video scenes from my most recent experiences in nature. Trust that these are not my only experiences in the woods, but rather a small snapshot of things I've been working on over the last few years. Keep in mind that my history as a woodsman goes well back into my youth. First a little about me. My name is Chris and I currently live in southern Ontario. I grew up in northern Ontario and as a young adult moved south for school and work. Because I grew up in a northern climate, I am cold tolerant. As I now reside in the south of Ontario, I am also accustomed to high temperatures and humidity. But my true self still relies on the north. I grew up predominantly fishing and now mix my outdoor time with both hunting and fishing as I chase various seasons. Since I have spent a lot of time in the woods, rather than on simply developing certain skills, I consider myself not a survivalist or bushcrafter, but a woodsman. A woodsman is someone who spends a lot of time in the woods without focusing on anything in particular, but works hard to accomplish many tasks which when completed, make the time spent more productive and comfortable. While I know much about survival and bushcraft, I find these labels far too restrictive. I find woodsman suits my disposition and interests far better. Recently, I have begun to immerse myself more into wilderness living, the act of feeding oneself from the land. I have learned more about wild edibles, including plants, and also researching feasible ways to collect sufficient calories in order to live indefinitely in the wild. At first, this may sound simple, but I have found that this is far from being the case. I can also produce fire by friction, with hand drill and also bow drill. I know hundreds of wild edibles. I have spent the better part of the last few years focusing on my limitations and continue to reduce the list of skills in which I was deficient as a woodsman. I have filmed much of my experiments and have shared them right here on YouTube. As a kid, fire was something we snuck around practicing. Matches from the corner store produced small bushfires, just to see if we could. This was part of my life in the north, but certainly not normal for all kids, especially those growing up in the city. But for us, it was just playing around we weren't specifically out to educate ourselves, we were just out there. Being in the woods was just part of my childhood. I never thought any of the things we did in the woods was special. Fun, yes, but not special. Trying to snare and arrow rabbits, catching frogs, minnows, and fish, cutting trails through unexplored woods, exploring swamps, forests, hillsides, building forts, and collecting raspberries was something that was fun. I never considered them to be skills. I like to keep so-called survival techniques in perspective. I know how they work, have researched them, but I also understand that in most cases, they won't provide sufficient nutrition to make it worthwhile. Take the Paiute deadfall trap for example. Building, creating, tending, and defending a deadfall trap is unlikely to produce a net positive yield. Yes, they can and do work, but they are just unlikely to produce more calories than they cost to build. The same general idea goes for various primitive bird traps. Fish traps are by far the exception. These can be effective. They include fish weirs, trot lines, and set lines. I would argue generally against fish funnel traps, though when properly built and executed have limited success. 
On this modern planet, active hunting by gun and fishing by rod and reel are usually the only ways that a person can hope to sufficiently feed themselves. Much of this reason is due to game laws which prevent passive trapping, snaring, and netting. The modern metal conny bear trap, for example, is deadly, but even modern trappers would find it difficult to live off food from their trap lines alone. In survival though, hunting should be done through mainly passive ways including long waits for prey to come to you. This can be done through baiting or setting up along animal trails. I'm very patient and adept at these skills, often spending hours upon hours relatively motionless while hunting white-tailed deer with a bow. Most deer that I have taken have been within 15 yards, but this takes time. Usually upwards of 15 hunts are required to be successful at deer. As for shelter building, the issue is less about skill, as I have a background in renovation and construction, but more applicably, I played around with shelter building since I was very young and have produced all sorts of unique and interesting structures, including underground bunkers, giant plastic forts, a snow-based structure such as Quincy's, which have provided shelter for me down to minus 30 degrees Celsius. Of course, I've also built the more common lean-tos. It amazes me to watch adults become obsessed with building structures, which I long ago moved away from. But even adults should make time for play. Of all of these shelters, there's nothing more efficient and effective than a modern tent. When biting insects are not a factor, a simple tarp shelter is more than sufficient for a two-month stay. The less elaborate the shelter, the more energy can be conserved to endure and outlast. But, like everything, context is important. If the climate warrants a specific shelter, I would adapt. Really, when it comes to shelter, the real question isn't what I can build, but rather what shelter is necessary and what caloric budget has been afforded to me. Whatever the case, I won't overspend my calories, even if it means having to deal with a very basic shelter that does nothing more than keep me out of the elements. In survival, calories are the only real asset that matters, and if one wishes to outlast, then they are not to be misused. I'm not big on gimmicks or drama, and maybe that doesn't fit well in a reality TV show, but I know what I'm talking about and have done my research. Most important, I have an open mind, am goal-focused, and a natural problem solver. My threshold for pain, suffering, and discomfort is high. As I said, I spent the better part of my life in the woods, hunting, fishing, camping, canoeing, hiking, and exploring and playing and testing various skills, primitive and modern. I've done solo trips, trips with friends, and trips with my family. Being outside is not foreign to me. I don't fear wild animals or predators or odd sounds in the night and don't mind being alone. Despite enjoying my time in the woods, I don't see being in nature as therapy. I'm not on a personal journey or a quest of discovery. This isn't to say that I haven't had to deal with hardship. It just means that being on a survival challenge is more about living in the moment and facing the current issue. When I'm in the woods, I'm in the present, solving current troubles and not dwelling on the past or wishing for a future. Trying to live off the land is problem enough to garner my complete focus. Being alone gives ample time to spend exploring the deepest recesses of the mind, but there are more pertinent issues to solve when in the wild. I'm fine with my own company, and at times, much prefer it to being in busy city centers. I'm not a hermit though, not by any stretch. I do enjoy being with people, especially smaller groups of people, where deeper connections can form, but I'm not afraid to be alone. I have done many solo trips in the woods. Through my trips, however, I found that while having company is not necessary, it is much preferred, but having people to share the outdoors with is not a requisite to being in nature. I often hunt and fish by myself, as family or friends are not always conveniently available or willing to test themselves. I don't fear bears, wolves, or other wild animals. With a background in biology, I understand animals in so much as they can be understood. There is no reason to give them a bad reputation or convince people that nature is to be feared. This is a great disservice to wild places. I welcome the chance to prove my ability to endure. Being alone offers a healthy respite from city life where the soul can recharge and peace can be found. It's worth emphasizing that I have actually tried to live off the land for five days straight, something that most so-called survival experts have never actually attempted or experienced. My trial run, which took place in August in Northern Ontario, was shared right here on YouTube under the Wilderness Living Challenge. If you have not yet watched the series, I urge you to make the time to fully digest it. I learned a lot filming the series and what it really takes to live off the land. This was a time to match theory and practice and decide for myself which ideas about survival, so often taught, actually have merit and which are simply wasteful or even harmful. 
To make the challenge interesting and different, we allowed ourselves to bring whatever modern tools we thought would be useful, but with one very important catch, something that makes it totally different than any other survival challenge. Over the course of five days, we were not to lose any body weight at all. Without spoiling the series, I would say that this was by far much more difficult than I had anticipated. We lost a lot of weight, more than I figured even possible. It was dramatic, painful, and humbling to shed so many pounds in just a short period of time. As a fisher and hunter, and more recently wild edible forager, I have often produced from the wild much table fare. However, when survival is dependent on producing a total diet with no backstops or food rations, small daily food deficits compound quickly. I learned a lot about just how limited wild edibles really are, especially when it comes to nourishing an active body which needs 3,500 calories per day in order to stay healthy. I quickly learned that to thrive in nature and avoid starvation was difficult. For modern man, wilderness living is a tall order indeed. For those that haven't tried to live off the land, solutions seem simple, even obvious. But as we illustrated in our wilderness living series, this is not the reality. We quickly learned that wilderness living was not just about having a strong will, good health, ability to do hard work, and knowledge. We needed much more. Yes, those qualities are important, but more important than just brute force was having the correct strategy. One could not live off the land without health and strength, that's for certain, and knowledge is needed for wild edible identification, hunting, fishing, trapping, and so forth, but opportunity must also exist. Animals, fish, and wild plant edibles must be abundant and offer themselves in a way that is attainable, with minimal gear and minimal caloric expense. However, through my study and experience, the single most important factor in wilderness living is strategy. The balance between energy output and energy input is something that matters to all animals, big or small. Strategy is something each one of our ancestors, the ones who successfully left descendants, understood, either rationally or just an application. Those who had a bad strategy and didn't balance their expenditures with productivity perished and left no descendants. Our ancestors knew what tasks produced a positive net yield and which ones did not. When something worked well, they did more of that, and when it didn't, they either remedied it or abandoned the practice and did something else. Starvation sets in quickly in nature, and food is a very strong motivator. All animals are wired for food acquisition and intuitively understand if something is helping or hindering their health. While modern Western people are no exception to natural laws, we understand what works and what doesn't when it comes to food. We have it much easier than our ancestors. Food is a mere afterthought for much of today's people. However, like our ancestors, we've grown accustomed to performing tasks which produce food, except these are far removed from how they were done by our ancestors. Modern first world people have become conditioned to assume that whenever hunger is present, food would be available. In nature, this isn't so. Money buys nothing in nature. To get food in nature, people must work in a way that is totally foreign to what they are accustomed. The reality we found in our experiment is that much of the wild edibles we knew to be in season, and many weren't, simply could not meet our daily caloric requirements. And during our short five-day experiment, we ate a lot. In fact, we consumed about 18 pike between the two of us, but this wasn't even close to enough to maintain ourselves. In one day alone, we ate a few pounds of blueberries and as many choke cherries as humanly possible. Mushrooms were limited, and the biggest issue, tubers, including wapato and cattail roots, which compromised mostly starches, were not in season. However, even if they were, they are still costly to collect and require processing. The bulk of these, especially cattail, is high in fiber and mostly made up of water. Therefore, a huge amount of cattail need be eaten to meet food requirements. Other more valuable sources of nutrition such as acorns, much like the tubers, are predominantly a fall crop. Most wild edibles have a season, and if you miss it, you must wait until the following year for more to appear. If they are not collected, cured, and properly stored, you must do without, and nature will not shed a tear. It cares not if you suffer. Finding the sorts of carbohydrates that our bodies craved during the wilderness living challenge was a major issue. Berries were a staple, but didn't offer us the carbohydrates that the brain and body crave. Others, like bunch berries, were plentiful, but low in calories. Choke cherries were easy to pick, but we quickly reached a consumption limit. They couldn't be eaten endlessly. To make matters worse, we found that traditional wild edibles, which we knew were in season at the time, were absent from wild places. 
Ironically, these same wild edibles can be located all around my urban home. Being devoid of disturbed soil was a major factor when it comes to the presence and absence of wild foods. We learned that being closer to urban centers, where man has cleared forest and produced edge habitat, were much more hospitable to wild foods, and game animals for that matter, than typical wild areas with a dense shade canopy such as our northern boreal forest. Dense forests overshadow lower berry and wild edible weed plants, making it impossible for them to grow. As I have discussed many times on my YouTube channel, the research in my experience bears out the fact that having a strategy which matches energy inputs to energy outputs is vital to ousting other competitors in a winner-takes-all open-ended survival challenge. If one cannot replace calories burned through acquisitions from the environment, then stored body energy is simply being wasted rather than invested. When a person carelessly burns energy with useless and unproductive tasks for which nourishment is not available to help the body recover, one is quite literally burning oneself alive. With each and every breath, part of a person is released back into the world through catabolism. As part of the cycle of life, through starvation, the human body is expelled, depleted, and returned back from where it came from. Once the heart is consumed and stops beating, the body will cease to be able to repair itself and the nutrients which made the body will be consumed and digested and used by other plants and animals. I contend that many, if not all previous cast members of Alone, with the possible exception of David McIntyre, has simply starved the way through the contest. Dave has explained that after shedding 30 pounds, he was able to stabilize his body weight by combination of increased food production through fishing and crab catching, as well as increased energy conservation. Thus, I have come to the conclusion that lasting indefinitely in nature with just 10 primitive items most likely requires a person to live a relatively lazy lifestyle. A person's resting metabolic rate, RMR, is approximately 1500 to 1700 calories a day. RMR is the amount of calories needed to keep a body alive as it lies flat on its back. 1500 calories is therefore the magic number to live indefinitely so long as other requirements including heat and water are provided. However, we know that this wouldn't be the case in survival, as food is not freely and passively supplied, and most people will not tolerate laying flat on their back for 24 hours a day. So, a successful survivalist must access a minimum of 2,500 calories per day. This assumes that a person will burn 1,500 calories due to the RMR, and then require an additional 1,000 calories minimum in order to acquire food and water, as well as perform other necessary duties including shelter fabrication, fire, and overall camp maintenance. Thus, it should be noted that making an elaborate shelter, building large superfluous projects, and endlessly burning firewood for comfort or otherwise would not be part of my survival strategy. I will note now that I don't find that I need much besides freedom to have a sound mind, so burning calories just to entertain myself is not something I would be compelled to do. A 2500 calorie a day strategy by mostly passive means would no doubt be difficult to implement not only does it fly in the face of our modern high-paced lives, but it also assumes that calories can be achieved mostly without working. In a 2500 calorie budget, 1500 would be spent on the body by default through their RMR, and the remaining 1000 calories spent over 4 hours of hard work, which is 250 calories per hour, in order to set snares, fish, hunt, as well as collect and purify water, perform fire duties, use on shelter maintenance, and so forth. This might seem logical and feasible, but 2,500 calories attained from nature with limited gear is a tall order. It represents a few pounds of lean fish, about 10 red squirrels, 2 rabbits, a raccoon or equivalent every 3-4 to four days, 10 pounds of berries daily, 15 pounds of cattail flour daily, or 1.5 pounds of processed acorn flour daily, or 7 pounds of burdock root daily. If these numbers seem like a lot of food, it's because it is. Wild foods are notorious for being lean and low in fat. Wild foods are high in fiber and mostly water. They are very much different than our highly processed, calorie-dense modern foods. If the environment turns out to be much more harsh and less plentiful, then a conserve versus produce strategy as mentioned above becomes even more crucial. In fact, in a difficult environment, where calories are not easily taken from the environment, there is an increased necessity to adopt this very strategy. Energy conservation and carefully rationing energy expenditures becomes the name of the game. To outlast is to use calories wisely and spend them on vital tasks only 
and do so early in the competition before it's too late. While one might assume that finally procuring a big meal after days of work will restore the body back to normal function, this isn't at all the case. After running long deficits for days, the body will require a long refeeding regimen to restore body tissues. In fact, after running deficits for only 5 short days, I found that my body craved food for nearly 2 months, with every meal satisfying a deeper than ordinary craving. Incidentally, this brought great satisfaction. Recently, much has been said about ketogenic diets. In survival, getting carbohydrates, which the brain craves, is often difficult. After just a few short hours without sugar, the body will begin to enter a keto stage and start converting and breaking down protein in order to feed the brain. Body fat is also accessed, but with a mostly protein diet, other problems occur, especially when that protein is totally lean. After a few weeks of eating nothing but lean meat, the body will experience digestive issues including diarrhea. To remedy this, 80% of a nothing but meat diet should be made up of fats, but often this isn't something that could be adjusted at will. Fat is hard to come by in nature. It is located in the skin, as fatty deposits under the skin, in bone marrow, and in the brain of animals. It's common sense that the body burns calories much faster when it is active. A resting body burns only 50 calories per hour. A working body burns 150 calories, and one doing hard work burns even more, around 250 calories per hour. To be alive is to burn calories, but the amount of calories burned in a given amount of time is a matter of choice. Calories may be used to amuse, to build interesting things, to create comfort, to distract, and to soothe from emotional issues. On the other hand, calories can be used wisely to win and outlast competitors. I am capable and willing to focus my total energy on the task at hand, and have done so for very long periods of time. I would not burn calories for any other reason but to outlast. The war is in being the last to stand, to win the prize, but the battle is against calories. The mind, however, is the real obstacle. Without mastering the mind and its flaws, there can be no victory. In survival, there is little doubt that the competition is not about man against man. Instead, it is man against himself, as well as man against nature. The oldest of competitions. Understand whom one is fighting is half the battle. I have come to the conclusion through discussions with many people that there is little concept about what a person should do to win a survival show such as alone. Some of the confusion lies in the fact that many disagree about the aim of the show. For some, it's about a journey of self-discovery. Self-discovery might be the case, but for our purpose, we'll just leave those behind because self-discovery can happen anywhere. We don't need a show to figure out ourselves. Others claim that the show is about dealing with solitude. I, again, argue that if someone wants to be alone, there are places where this can be done. It certainly doesn't need to be shown broadly on television. Some think it's just about testing the self but I've already done this too, and featured it on my YouTube channel, and I didn't need the approval from a major television network to do it. So I contend that the show alone, in its most authentic form, is about outlasting the other contestants, and winning the prize money. So with that in mind, I will analyze what a contestant should do in order to get those results. While in the woods, one might do many things including hunt and fish, build structures or chairs, or do whatever it takes to be rescued alive. For simplicity, these fall in three main categories, wilderness living, bushcraft, and survival, respectively. They are all often confused as one thing, and this is where people get into trouble. No doubt, to win the competition, and generally speaking, a little bit of all these things must be done. Someone needs to catch food, erect a shelter, and be rescued without dying. The real dilemma and debate is how much of each should be done. What's the correct recipe? Of course, the answer is nuanced and context-specific. A bushcrafter, for example, is someone who creates many things out of nature with a few key tools, a saw and an axe, usually, and also a knife. He can make chairs, pot hangers, friction fire, shelters, fire reflectors, cordage, gorge hooks, gill nets, snares and traps, and so forth. Naturally, some of these need to be done in order to win. In wilderness living, a person's main goal is to live long term in the wild. His main aim is to get food on a regular basis and replace what he burns while doing so. This includes fishing and hunting by whatever means are afforded to him. To live long term in the wild, most would agree that a gun is paramount as is a fishing rod, a canoe, and metal conny bear traps, but this is besides the point. 
Wilderness living includes bushcraft skills, but bushcraft does not require elements of wilderness living. To make this clear, someone who does bushcraft can bring their own food from modern sources and be just fine within their element. A survivalist, on the other hand, merely wants to stay alive long enough to effect a rescue back to civilization. A strict survivalist may also do bushcraft and wilderness living, but only just enough to escape. On the other hand, someone who does wilderness living wants to live indefinitely in the wild and do so by eating from wild sources. So I contend that to win alone, which is an open-ended contest that can last up to a year, the main focus is on wilderness living rather than just bushcraft or survival. With sufficient body weight and body fat though, a person could win by simply doing survival, energy conservation with no need to acquire new food. With a high amount of body fat, a person can get away with very little wilderness living, or even bushcraft skills for that matter. Finding fresh potable water, erecting a shelter to keep dry and warm are the only real skills one needs if food is not part of the equation, as is the case when ample body fat reserves are present. What really matters when trying to outlast is balance between bushcraft and wilderness living. Doing too much bushcraft might mean that someone actually does too much to create comfort and wastefully burns through their energy stores. Without adding new energy to their system, a bushcrafter can easily outconstruct his own body stores of energy and not survive. Many critics of alone claim that a person should build comfortable and elaborate shelters without considering the cost of doing so. To build a basic lean-to structure requires much wood and processing and hauling. If one does not consider the net energy return on their investment, then the structure built through bushcraft is merely an energy loss rather than an energy saver. It should be noted that bushcraft can often attract high energy costs. Additionally, many bushcraft projects are simply not necessary for survival. While a bushcrafter might make a fancy chair, a survivalist will make do with a fallen tree or just sit on the ground. The bushcrafter could take hours to produce a chair, which is not necessary for survival. This is a difficult concept for a person who is accustomed to being well-fed to understand. Someone doing too much bushcraft may actually be compromising his own survival. Nature doesn't care if you have a fancy shelter or a comfortable chair. When you run out of energy, you will die. Someone who focuses on wilderness living is not given an unlimited budget, but instead must carefully balance energy in and energy out. To build a structure requires a certain amount of calories, and these must either be obtained first through fishing, hunting, or foraging, or replaced after the fact. There are no two ways about it. Energy costs must be balanced in order to live long-term in nature. To do wilderness living is to use energy derived from nature wisely. To outlast the other competitors, therefore, one must practice wilderness living rather than simply do bushcraft. Survival may also suffice as a tactic to win because, unlike in bushcraft, there is a strong concern about staying alive. I will note though that in survival, there are also elements of bushcraft and wilderness living, but unlike wilderness living, there is less emphasis on a long-term horizon. The first chance to escape is taken. So while a survivalist in its most raw form may win, it really depends on whom the survivalist is competing against. If someone can carefully balance their calories and not run deficits, the win will always go to the person practicing wilderness living because, in theory, in practice, that person can live forever in nature. In closing this topic, I want to remind people that someone who practices wilderness living is in it for the long haul and is looking at the whole picture, all of the moving parts, everything that could be done in nature, including caloric expenditures, food acquisition, and comfort versus energy savings. With wilderness living, it's not just about single elements, it's the whole thing. A gill net, set fishing lines, and snares must be utilized first and foremost. Gill nets and snares have a long and successful history. Not only did they work historically, they still do today. More on this later, but modern so-called survival teaches impractical techniques to catching game, including various deadfall traps. Other historic methods like gorge hooks can and do work. I've used them myself but they often have expenses that are far too high to be considered net energy positives rather than net energy consumers. The alone experiment thrusts people much farther back into our history than most people realize. Guns go back to the 13th century and were vital to early settlers looking not only to survive but thrive. The firearm produces more realistic success than does wooden bows and arrows, atlatls, spears, and so forth. 
While these other primitive tools were used to great effect, they never produced great abundance. Additionally, we currently live in a much depleted world. Natural resources are relatively absent today compared to even just a hundred years ago. Our success with guns and our modification of forests and field habitat have changed the world to one of relative natural scarcity. We have turned our most productive land into cities and paved them over. That land is not land that produces wild foods for us any longer. Man as predator and man as agriculturalists has succeeded. Man is no longer a hunter and forager, but now stretches to all corners of the planet and uses that land in a way that is foreign to wilderness living. It goes without saying that prey animals are certainly not nearly as abundant as they once were. Further, mastery of animal husbandry and agriculture were the real skills which permitted man to flourish. None of this is lost on me, nor was it lost during our experiments on the wilderness living challenge. We learned quickly that a hand-to-mouth existence is tiring and risky, and yet trying to replicate this ancestry is exhilarating and helps us to recharge, while also making us feel thankful for what we already have. Should modern laws not have prevented us from hunting, a gun would surely have been employed to help level the playing field. Game laws put in place to protect dwindling prey animals are necessary today, but this speaks to the relative levels of opportunity when trying to live off the land. Many laws have been enacted to limit the harvest of wild animals including creel numbers for fish and bag limits for small and large game. These are major inhibitors to success when trying to make a living from the land. Therefore, when trying to live off the land, legal regulations cannot at all be discounted. They are a major factor in wilderness living. The default to living passively, of course, is body fat store retention. It's far easier to keep a calorie as body fat rather than find a new calorie from nature. It is rare that an active day produces sufficient calories from nature to replace what was burned, and this is with modern equipment including fishing rods, guns, compound bows, and metal traps. Feeding oneself off the land is not at all easy. Also consider that one pound of fat is equal to 3,500 calories, or about one day's worth of food. If one does not eat for one day and they are active, they will burn 3,500 calories and drop one pound in body weight. My frame holds only a finite and limited amount of body fat. I assume that I will be able to last about 20 days on body fat alone. Should I pack in double rations, 10 pounds of food, I would perhaps live 10 more days. As an extension to this, I could likely live another 30 days on passive food from gill nets, passive fishing, and snaring. Unless I could truly master the environment and have a ready store of food, this sets a benchmark of around 60 days a number that has been previously set by other contestants. If I am in a familiar environment where fish is present and laws are not restrictive, I believe that I could surpass previous records, but not without implementing an ideal strategy. I would argue that few past contestants have actually considered their strategy before setting off and likely only ended up as energy conservers by default. Without food, the body eventually tires and cannot sustain high activity levels. This is even more pronounced on a ketogenic diet consisting of lean meat. In a passive strategy, the body begins to shut itself down. It's important to know that some contestants have burned as much as 60 pounds of body fat before reaching this position. That's an astonishing one pound of body weight per day and assumes that they did not produce one net positive calorie during 60 days of so-called survival. In other words, no actual wilderness living took place, just slow dying. While one pound per day might sound like a lot, it's by no means the upper limit. Burning one and a half to two pounds is certainly possible at peak activity levels and no food consumption. It often surprises people to learn that it's possible to live an entire year without eating. An experiment tracked an overweight person for a full year. In that time, they averaged around three quarters of a pound of body weight loss per day. They consumed only some salts and potassium as well as as much water as they desired. So the idea that wilderness survival has nothing to do with body fat, or it's of minor importance, presupposes that a person is otherwise unwilling to suffer through starvation and is lean to begin with. A person of sound mind with plenty of body fat and a willingness to test himself is surely capable of enduring living in the wild for months without achieving much productivity at all. We must be conscious of the fact that such a strategy is not wilderness living, but rather an extension of our modern life using our fat stores derived from a plentiful environment to avoid death in a natural one. Getting food is always the challenge in wilderness living. Many wild foods, especially plants, 
berries, roots, and tubers are seasonal. They are not available all at the same time, nor do they have a long harvest season. Things to make teas are often readily available, but the more precious, the ones that really keep a person alive, have a limited shelf life. Overall, greens and leaves are of questionable value. Often these have a cause in terms of digestion, but can still serve in the diet as fiber and delivery mechanisms for nutrients. To have a balanced diet is to consume a good variety of both plants, protein, and fat. One can never truly rely on the availability of wild edibles. There is much myth surrounding naturally growing foods. For one, they are often located in disturbed soil, soil that has been cleared of trees and turned over by machines or man. Most wild edibles are found in clear cuts, logging roads, trails, and other open areas which are typical of lands close to urban centers. Wild edibles are unlikely to be found in any great abundance in areas that we would consider natural. It always amazes me to compare the amount of wild edible foods around my urban house to areas that I typically camp. Urban centers often have more wild edibles, in greater abundance, and more easily access than wild areas. In some cases, too, urban centers often have even more wildlife. For example, urban areas typically have more bird species, squirrels, raccoons, and skunks and deer. Man creates edge habitat, which are more highly productive than deep woods with a thick canopy. However, it is still important to understand what wild foods are available, when, where, and how to use them. I have focused my more recent research on how best to use wild edibles and what they really mean to a modern forager. I have tried to eat enough wild edibles to produce a daily allotment of calories, and unlike a modern diet, I have failed each time. In many cases, it is physically impossible to not only procure enough wild foods to eat, but also to swallow and digest it. The human body is simply not designed to eat 2.5 pounds of dry lean fish meat in a day, for example, and this is what it would take to replace a modern diet of 3,500 calories, the amount needed to fuel an active body. In other cases, collecting wild foods efficiently enough to replace what is burned collecting them is the culprit. I have estimated it takes about 150 black walnuts in order to produce 3,500 calories. That's a lot of nuts. Black walnuts are not edible straight from the ground, they need to be collected, processed, and dried. Other wild edibles also have limitations. Tannins need to be leached from acorns, for example. Tubers must be dug and unearthed or freed from the muddy bottom of a lake. Nothing comes easy in wilderness living. There are no free lunches. Many wild edible experts tout the benefit of wild foods, but few have actually experienced eating them. Many wild foods are simply not palatable at all. I found this to be the case with such things as the lily tuber, which requires up to four changes of water before it resembles something close to edible. Others are simply so loaded with fiber and water that pounds of the stuff must be consumed in order to properly make a living. This notwithstanding, I have a solid knowledge of what is available and what is not, as well as their limitations. While what I know might not make me fat from wild foods, they will invariably affect my strategy. And this is important because it turns me into a casual and opportunistic forager rather than someone under the illusion that things are simple. It turns me into an energy saver rather than an energy consumer. Many focus on protein, but this is a mistake. Ketogenic diets can lead to severe and negative gut reactions and eventual starvation, even if one could consume the required daily calories. A diet of lean protein in wilderness survival is commonly referred to as rabbit starvation. While the condition is named after consumption of rabbits, they aren't the only wild animals to carry small amounts of fatty reserves. It is well known that many wild animals are low in fat, including fish and other game. Any form of fat is therefore a valuable commodity and not to be used without care. A diet of just protein, devoid of carbohydrates and plants needs to be balanced with nearly 80% fat. Fat being the least energy costly to digest and most energy dense is by far the most valuable molecule in nature. Without fat, it's nearly impossible to get ahead of calorie requirements, and fat is not easily obtained from natural sources. I understand the challenges of finding fat in the wild. When possible, fat should be brought into nature and help supplement what can be readily caught such as fish and small game. There is a reason pemmican, which is cured animal fats such as bear or moose fat, enriched and flavored with dry berries was packed along with early settlers and explorers. It wasn't just light and portable, but necessary. Without fat, the body will literally starve to death on protein alone. Therefore, trapping animals and using what fat they have is a necessary part of long-term living. This can come from many animals and birds, including duck, 
so long as the skin is not removed, but depends highly on the location. In my region, bear, moose, raccoon, beaver, waterfowl, and to some extent deer have fat to offer. It should be noted that fat from deer is not considered very palatable since it coats the mouth with a film which can be off-putting. But while living off the land, Long cannot afford to be choosy. Bear and moose fat is by far more delectable. My strategy when it comes to diet would be a careful balance between passive and sessile hunting and fishing and energy conservation. Arrowing animals on game trails, snaring, set lines, and so forth would be employed first. If that failed, I would carefully weigh out the possibility between investing actively in the pursuit of game and energy conservation. As I have previously tried to live off the land, I can assure you that a rod and reel with full tackle and a canoe does not level the playing field sufficiently to produce a well-rounded diet, even with ample berries are added. A long gun, connie bear traps and snares coupled with lax game laws and open restrictions are likely the most important factors one needs in order to make it a long-term living in the wild. This fact is not lost on me. Fire is a tool, but also represents to many a source of comfort. What most don't realize is that fire is also a burden and a huge energy cost. Many find that fire is a source of comfort, a friend, but I do not see fire this way. Fire is a way to cook food and to purify water. Fire is only a source of heat when clothing has failed, either when it is chosen poorly or when it has gotten wet. To rely on fire to comfort, soothe, heat, and protect from so-called predators is, in most cases, a mistake. If one has sufficient clothing for the given environment, heat from a fire becomes superfluous and is a mere liability and cost. I have spent many nights at negative 20 degrees Celsius and beyond without fire. A proper sleep system is more than enough to ward off a chill, even in the most extreme conditions. Often, simply collecting and processing wood is enough to ward off a chill. Using the body in fire prep raises its temperature, thus burning calories. While winter camping in my youth, in poor equipment including a summer sleeping bag, I would often wake cold. To put myself back to sleep, I would simply take a 15-minute midnight run in the snow. This would raise my body temperature and permit me to fall back asleep. In the long run, this was a net energy saver despite the overall cost. Even though I was wastefully expending calories by running, it was still far less expensive than producing firewood and tending a fire. My midnight run would take only a few minutes and would bring me to the same place of would hours of work laboring over a fire. By keeping fires small and to a minimum, and only using them for cooking and water purification, energy can be reallocated to other more important matters. As mentioned, I do not need fire for comfort, security, or to busy my mind. I have nothing to grind. My mind is already sound. After listening to my rationale, one might think that my 10 items to pack along a survival challenge would be food and food alone, but this might not be sufficient to outlast other competitors, nor permissible under the rules. Ultimately, two food rations might only replace about 20 days worth of calories at best, and this assumes using an almost totally passive strategy. Along with my current body fat, this may only just barely bring me to the finish line and would be highly dependent on whom I was competing against and their strategy. The risk, of course, is that I may be matched up with another competitor with as much will as me but a heavier disposition. Some people can easily carry upwards of 40 pounds of body fat, this person would be very difficult for me to outlast. Being against a person with a high body fat would force me to be a net energy producer. A look in the mirror says that nature has designed me to be a hunter and fisher, to be active, to forage, and to produce, a no-basket weaver. If I should find myself against a heavyweight, laying flat on my back will simply not be enough. In this case, a more balanced approach would be necessary. This would include other tools that could add to an already strong strategy. Having said all this, Fat is probably the most difficult but necessary commodity. Two rations of fat or fat equivalent would, for me, be a good place to start. This could be added to lean meats that were caught on site including fish and game or eaten plain as a supplement. Fat and lean fish make an excellent combination. Fat also fortifies and makes leafy greens much more digestible and complete. A gill net is an obvious choice. It's passive and highly effective. It's a wonder more don't use this very important and effective tool. Next is fishing line and hooks. Some line in a relatively light 8-10 to 10 pound test and another heavier amount to double a snare wire. Using the fishing line as snare wire or packing snare wire by itself will be location dependent. Game is not easy to catch in every environment. 
I would also pack a bow and arrows. I would honestly be very tough to make use of the bow and arrow, but it's the Hail Mary that I might need to win. I'd certainly attempt to get a big animal and could passively spend time and sit and wait as I have done for many years while hunting white-tailed deer to great success. I am not at all opposed to shooting large game and have done so for dozens of times in my life. Passive is the name of the game. While active hunting may produce more opportunity per hour, it's also a heavy cost and time-consuming. Animals are mainly nocturnal, so if hunting could be done by spotlight and was legal, this would be effective. Hunting is at its peak at dusk and dawn. The same general rules apply to fishing. Most animals are either nocturnal, to escape detection of man and ambush prey, or are crepuscular, preferring to move about during light inflection periods at dusk and dawn. Bait sites made with fish remains can attract both predators and scavengers, ideal for the sessile weight and bait hunter. Snares can be set up near bait sites to trap animals in a nearly passive manner. Set lines and trot lines for fish set in the most productive water of 10 to 20 feet are also on my list of tasks. A gill net should be set perpendicular to the water's edge and at the same depth and immediately. It only takes moments to set up and works tirelessly at all hours of the day and night. Where running water is present, such as a river, trot lines can be strung across as can a gill net. For active fishing, fish can be moved downstream into a gill net by walking in the stream bed. Fish weirs made by stacking rocks and water inlets where tides are present also work by trapping fish in pools. Fish weirs date back centuries. They work. A makeshift rod can also be used to catch fish, especially in the early and late hours of the day where fish come to the shallows to feed in low light. Otherwise, catching fish this way can be difficult since the productive water is so far from shore. A raft or boat is energy intensive and unlikely to produce a net return, but would be considered given the climate. It would certainly not be viable at frigid temperatures. A bait suspended in the water column with the help of a float is also effective while passive fishing. Being adaptable and understanding fish and game is part of being successful in the long run. Tide does much for the scavenger because it uncovers food each cycle. This is important to keep in mind. Other items I would bring include an extremely warm sleeping bag for long periods of rest and energy conservation. An axe is not necessary, a saw is nearly a must. A knife is of marginal overall importance, some may argue this, but a knife is standard, hard to imagine not bringing one. A knife does much work in the processing of animals, as well as the creation of tools and spears. A ferro rod is necessary for making fire, to cook and purify water. One simply cannot count on friction fire. It's too energy costly and not reliable. The 10 items provided by the show is certainly not enough to ensure long-term success, not by a long shot. Many relied on guns, agriculture, and domesticated animals to actually live long-term off the land. But 10 items with strict limitations are all that is afforded. I realize that 10 items is enough to give a fighting chance, but nothing more. However, I would question the effectiveness of the items and would warn anyone that many of them can be misused and actually, even while properly used, result in additional energy being wasted. Whatever tools are brought, they should be used in a careful and measured way. Few applicants to the show really understand what it's like to produce a total diet from nature. Many have never eaten from the land in any way that resemble what was done by our ancestors. To replicate a hunter-gatherer lifestyle is difficult given how humans have changed the environment and depleted natural resources. To ultimately win the show, it's important to keep in mind these limitations. It's highly unlikely that anyone would ever produce sustenance that affords them to last more than a few months as energy deficits will eventually catch up to any competitor sound enough of mind to endure isolation. There are many things that I don't particularly find easy about living in nature, but when things are difficult, it reminds me that I'm still alive. Through pain and suffering, I can separate myself from the dead. The dead can't feel. Even if I'm not chosen for the show, so be it. As always, I lead my own path. That said, I will still continue to do things I love and care about. One part of me that never abates is my love of being in nature and living off the land, producing my own food and scavenging a living from wild sources. It helps me to connect with my history something that was born into me, something I was not given a choice to love. For the better, it's simply part of who I am. To all those who have subscribed to my channel and offer me positive and negative feedback and debate my videos, encourage me, thank you. I really do appreciate having this outlet of expression. 
as well as the opportunity to share and discuss with you all matters of topics surrounding wilderness living and the outdoors. Sincerely, Chris, the Wooded Beardsman.